um, because I'm also into um, Renaissance music, like and Middle Ages music, and early music, and uh, because I love listening to sort of early kind of folk music as well as just um, I have a peculiar t taste of uh, in music. When I say sort of like I don't just mean Irish music. I mean uh, I don't know, like folk music as such. Um, I love the sound. There's, there's certain archaic tunes in, in Irish and Scottish music that you usually hear as slow airs. And there's just something different about them. Yeah, there's a different... They take kind of different twists and turns and there's a few kind of odd notes in them that sound almost like bum notes, but they're not. And I kind of later found out that that's that's part of an older kind of music notation kind of uh, rep repertoire would be the wrong word, but it's, you know, you know the, the standard that we have for a scale, um, if you're talking do, re, mi, is, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, like that's fairly modern. Um, that only kind of came about in the last kind of two, like say 300 years. When kind of early music was going into baroque music, and it kind of they, they were looking to standardize scales because orchestras were becoming a thing, and um, you know prior to the kind of baroque period, you you didn't have like huge big orchestras, and um, you had ensembles already, like you know like you know assembly, like a few sort of musicians. Uh, assembled together and but it was notoriously difficult to get their instruments to sound the same there was oftentimes there was no standards and um, so it was pretty localized now now I'm going off track a bit as well but it all ties in uh, to, to, what, to what I was initially talking about why I like sort of peculiar peculiar sounding folk songs or tunes it comes from this time, this transitional period in musical history where the in the Baroque period as 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 it's now kind of like if we're talking like in the classic music sense, um you had prior to the Baroque period, yeah, you did obviously have gatherings of musicians together. I'm not saying that, but but not in the, in an orchestral sense as we as we know it today. And so what you would find would be different instrument makers in different areas would make instruments in possibly a slightly different pitch do you know to the next so say you know say if you take an early wind instrument like a sham which is like a basically it's a reed instrument like a chanter like a, it's an early oboe or a chanter like it's you know basically a chanter with a reed in it that you blow straight onto, right? Stick the stick, you put that in your mouth and you blow that, right? So, the, the sham maker who lives in your village and who's making out making these instruments, well, his instruments are going to sound slightly different now. And you still get, get this obviously with different instrument makers to this day, like even though their m m instruments are made to a standard, you still get the instruments from one area would differ especially especially like in in the early modern like the early music periods like before baroque when i'm talking about there was a more pronounced difference often with instrument makers um from one place to another and so you've got a unique instrument maker making one of a kind instruments. He has his own standard that he's setting, and there is a general standard. Um, but his instruments are going to be a bit different to someone else's. Who's going to be different to someone else's again, and so on. And the same with reeds. You know, some reeds are going to sound sharp. Some are going to sound flat. Some are going to sound loud. And others, some are going to be soft, hard, soft. So, you know, before mechanization, before there were machines making instruments um, a lot of the a lot of the instruments were 
you, you actually you couldn't get them to play with each other in you know any huge group yes if you had places like say in london for example there were a lot of like flute makers living around i, I actually I, I only know this because i i ended up i bought one in a in a in an auction um, and I'd done a bit of research about this this flute. It was made of boxwood. It was made in sort of the early 1700s or whatever. I was in Saldi. But um, you had in London um, an area where there were several um, musician, uh, sorry, several instrument makers um, uh, thriving. Um, in the Baroque period uh, in London and they obviously were all close to each other and there was so many of them and there were generations of them that there was there was a standard to their instruments so like different makers could like different instruments from different makers could be played together because they were working with each other they were working for each other and they were working close to each other and there was a lot of them making the same kind of thing so there was a sort of a standard like you know and that happened in other places in other cities and in other countries where there was like this kind of proximity a closer proximity so they were making more standardized kind of instruments but in other places more we'll say rural areas or you know that once you left the cities sometimes the instruments took on their own unique kind of styles and character and and that and they may not be comparable or, or, or kind of playable with other instruments so and then of course like i suppose especially once kind of machines came into things and like that kind of set standards much you know more that you know things could be made much more identical than a previous type of thing um but i suppose the whole point of that was that up until sort of fairly recently in musical history, we'll say the early Baroque period, right? Which is this is rough, like, but it's roughly sort of 1650 to say 1750. That's kind of considered the transitional kind of time. Now, I'm I'm not a great expert on classical music or classical music history, but I'm just what I do is I reference that to to folk music um so if you sort of if you take the 100 year period even if it's a few years later so even if you take sort of say the late 16 sort of hundreds to the late 17 hundreds if you want to call that the Baroque period right that's no I'm not going to start nitpicking here um like prior to that the instruments as I'm stressing were not always uniform so large groups of musicians like weren't able to play together and um, the same way as we know them today as in orchestras that was a gradual thing that happened with standardization and as i say then they you know then there was a point in time where 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 they wouldn't kind of play the instrument from miles and miles away because it sounded a bit different to uh, I, like I thought that was good like, like these London guilds like there was like these guilds of like craftsmen and apprentice apprentices and and you know they sort of got established and they did make things to to a standard that as I say that instruments could from different makers could be played with each other but say then say if you went outside of London and you went up to say the heart of Scotland well that instrument maker because he's out of touch with the London scene even even just say for argument's sake even if he was trained in London with these makers he's making an instrument that's yeah yeah that is the same thing but maybe over time he, you know he might develop his own kind of style and then he kind of it, the, the tuning goes out a little bit like differently or somebody who hadn't been trained in these guilds who hadn't had an apprenticeship in London and say he was making an instrument, a similar instrument in Wales, 
you know, they're not going to make it the exact same way and it's not going to sound the exact same way or the materials that's being made from and stuff like that, you know, the suppliers, where your timber's coming from. All these little things have, have effects on how the instrument sounds. So, eventually it did, there was sort of standards then, the standards developed where they would just sort of buy certain instruments from certain makers and then that, I think, kind of, was a defining time between where it stops becoming folk music and it starts turning into a classic sense whether you want to call that like early music baroque or early classical the distinction then between the the folk music and the tunes and the instruments themselves are starting to sort of diverge their paths are starting to go in kind of different directions and um, so that's the instruments themselves. So if you take that the instruments themselves often couldn't even be played together, the the scales, musical scales as we know them, as I say, this the do re mi scale. Well, it wasn't always that way, and um, that came with that time. That started. You hear that in baroque music, and um, you some, you know. Towards the end of the Baroque period, you know, or maybe in the middle of it, I don't know exactly when, but at some point, this Do, Re, Mi scale became the fixed, the fixed scale. Because prior to that, there were actually different scales, close. Now, even today there is, look, you know, you can go on the internet and you can look up, you know, there's like, what is it, like there's a chromatic scale, then there's the diatonic scale, then there's... Oh, there's another one that I like. Um, the name eludes me at the moment. But yeah, then there's the pentatonic. Um, there's different scales, but generally, like you know, when we when we think of music, we think of do re mi. Okay, that's kind of and you know, that's the air sort of standard now. But in prior to the Baroque period folk music didn't necessarily have that as we know it today it was sort of different and there was kind of like kind of half notes and sort of semitones that sort of suited the period and the style of singing that was going on at the time so that's why like when we hear some sort of early early sort of songs kind of where you know, sort of if if we hear the song, you know, say from the fifteen hundreds, you know, like sort of say Henry the Eighth kind of music, we recognise it straight away. That it sounds uh, there's some sort of odd sound that it has. That that yeah, that sounds recognisably different in some ways to 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 modern sort of classical music. Like we know that it's, you know, mostly we know from films and documentaries or whatever, you'd see something about say Henry VIII and you hear this kind of background music, which he, by the way, he was a prolific um, musician and songwriter and he wrote tunes as well. And obviously he wrote in the period of the day and that sort of stuff had influences from like Italy and France and Germany and different countries like there were, you know, but, it was kind of folky in some ways as well. Like some of it was like English folk music. And it's not all that different. When you look at like actual, like when you look at like folk music from, again, from the perspective of our two islands, like Ireland, the island of, I island of Ireland and the island of like Britain. Y you know, the, the further kind of back that you go in time, the folk music starts sounding pretty much the same. Um, there's a shared repertoire and that's due to lots of things it's due to like obviously people traveling it's due to fashions you know it's due to well, i'd say that mainly travel that you know someone brings a song somewhere and it sounds great and then they like this the air of the song and then they might change the words of it over time sometimes songs like you'll get the same folk song on both of our islands with variants of words that's like really natural and um, but the air rem remains the same. Um, like I like one of my favourite songs uh, are yeah songs, or tunes. Um, I heard of it first of all as the star of the county down. 
um but that's like yeah um it's about a girl like from county down um, the maid with the nut brown hair and I, yes i only know as i started the county down then i heard another version of it called crooked jack uh, same air just different totally different words about a bloke uh, crooked jack and then i've recently come across a song from england with the exact same air and it's called what's it called the quiet grave or the lonely grave the quiet grave or the lonely grave and again it has the same air and it's a different subject matter altogether it's about a man who's like lamenting his love who's dead the unquiet grave that's it the unquiet grave and he's spending too much time at the grave of his loved one that he's not letting her rest and she wants him to to kind of i don't know like leave her leave her alone and get out like live out the rest of his life like and let her rest in peace but he wants to join her like he doesn't want that and he wants to kiss her cold clay lips and all that that's a brilliant song it's it's haunting like but uh, anyway it has the same air or the same tune to the stars of the county down and the crooked jack so you get you get obviously the same folk songs resurfacing at different times and in different places um so musical styles some kind of go unchanged and they've they've come down to us from the centuries i know i've been drawn to those ones that have this kind of I don't I can't even describe it. There's a there's a there's a, a note in them or there's a sort of a, a semitone or a twist um that's in them that's not in other ones. Like I can think of another one that's that goes like that as well. It's called the um the Twa Carbies. Um that's that means like the two crows are um that's another one that's sort of it's about these two ravens and the, the you know the steel i spanned on a brilliant version of that in the 70s and um, it's about these two ravens and, and and they're talking about like what are they going to eat today and then one says that they spotted a, a newly slain knight like who's who's lying dead like um who's lying dead beyond an old ditch or a Yonfeld elf beyond an old dike like or a ditch like this this newly slain knight is lying dead and the only ones that know he's there is his hawk and his hounds and his lady fair but his lady has taken another mate and all this so his woman has gone off with another man and the two ravens are saying well what they're going to eat him basically they're going to eat this knight and they're going to make a nest out of his hair and poke out his eyeballs and all that and but it has this archaic sound to it and the reason why it's because it's an old song like it's is it from the 1500s or the 1400s you know um and then there's an, there's another there's an english folk song uh, was it is, is it the two ravens or the three ravens it's a different air but it's a very similar it's a similar type of song um, about these two birds, the carvids and all that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of talking about like why over time music has changed from this archaic type of early music, almost medieval sounding music, ends up turning into sort of the early baroque and then that kind of go, went on into classic but like where did folk music like folk music was sort of out, out on the parameters of that or kind of held its own and so the different like folk music kind of wasn't standardized i suppose that's where i'm going with this folk music wasn't standardized the same way as as classic music ended up being standardized so the musical instruments were standardized in when we're, when we're talking in like the classic sense the instruments were, sta were standardized and the scales were standardized whereas in folk music that didn't happen the same way and so 
that's why like when it comes to like the likes of bagpipes I mean bagpipe music itself wasn't and this would have something earlier on about like pipe bands like they weren't standardized either um till as, as I say I'd argue that the latter part of the, the 1700s and it all fell into that type of uh, thing like so on the periphery of that folk music kind of held its own and the instruments themselves took on their own character and developed in their own way so like this is why we've this array, array of different kinds of bagpipe um like on these islands you know i spoke earlier on like you've got an island pipe and um, you've got this great highland bagpipe you've got a scottish small pipe you got a the border pipe um but in the north of england they'll call that a northumbrian half long uh, and then you've got of course the, the northumbrian pipes but there was once a whole array of other instruments that are now extinct um, especially played in England there was bagpipes played all over England um, there was the Leicestershire pipes for example and uh, pipes of different kind of shapes and sizes like many were mouth blown, many were bellows blown um, there was a fascinating bagpipe played in Wales uh, I'll talk about that when I'm talking about more earlier sort of instruments. Um, but anyway, essentially, um, England, the way I'm talking about the, the, how got onto that was that, the, the, that there's these two English men, uh, pipe makers, who were looking at the old extinct sets of bagpipes that were played in England. Um, and they were t thinking about, you know, like they were like, like studying these instruments like meticulously the ones that were left over in museums even pieces of pipes that were left in museums um julian goodacre and john swain and those two men are just ah uh, they're you know there's they're monumental like central pivotal to character like pipe makers who've like you know dedicated like most of their lives towards restoring the older extinct sets of pipes um that were played in in britain like not just england like parts of scotland as well and you know just like pipes that have become extinct and because i'm interested in the history of pipes as well i i, I came upon an early instrument um an earlier instrument than an illin pipe it's called a pastoral pipe so if you look at pastoral pipe you'll, you'll see them and you know, some say that Illum pipes kind of evolved out of an out of a pastoral pipe. Um, we could talk about the orange origins of 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 pipes. Uh, God till the cows come home. But this this kind of a pipe was a common pipe that was played across Ireland and Britain, anywhere in Britain and anywhere in Ireland. Um, uh, and you know. I don't know whether it was necessarily an ancestor of the modern mu of the modern instruments, or was it just kind of related to them? Was it just another another sort of a pipe? But basically, like instead of like as I say, the great Highland bagpipes, where you have a big, loud, kind of robust, like strong instrument for marching around with, like you know, going into battle and all that sort of stuff. That this was generally a sweeter, softer sounding pipe that um, ended up being played mostly with a bellows as opposed to being mouth blown. And so that you could play it basically, you know, indoors, sort of at your leisure, um, at kind of gatherings where you're not going to like blast everyone out of it. Um, and also sheep and you know herding cattle and sheep and goats and that like like shepherds like there's this all across not just Europe like but in the whole world of bagpipe and there's always been this pastoral uh, connection with pipes and pipers um, out with the flocks and out with herds and it's like right these music these lads have like loads of time on their hands to spare um, with with a uh, 
you know, just out like on the side of a hill, like for hours or days or whatever else on end, like looking after the herds that like what are you supposed to do in the meantime? So they played instruments and for some reason the pipes they played pipes became associated with that sort of rural kind of pastoral scene. And maybe these pipes were just called pastoral pipes sort of after these sort of shepherds. But as well there was a whole movement in kind of society in the seventeen hundreds um and sort of a early eighteen hundreds that kind of that romanticized um we romanticized that kind of pastoral scene. Um, you, you, it was kind of like in wealthier sort of society, like they, 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 they kind of, in some ways, kind of lamented the, 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 you know, the rural settings that a lot of them were like leaving behind to live in sort of, you know, built up towns and cities. Um, and sort of the ideal of the, the idyll or ideal or whatever how you pronounce that word, like of the landscape. And, you know, in the kind of the enlightenment and the, you know, you have this sort of the arts kind of movement and you've got like poetry and paintings and the glorify kind of the rural setting and mountains and, you know, sort of beautiful kind of pastoral scenes and the, the rustic kind of, you know, they, 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 they celebrated the, the rustic in everything, not just you know, the rustic man and the rustic setting and rustic homes, like cottages and in some ways to these wealthier people, like the peasantry kind of still kind of lived this kind of, they thought it was an idealistic sort of a, almost like lazy life, you know, that you just, you know, you don't have a whole lot of responsibilities. You just, you know, you just go out and look after your cattle and sheep and goats and pigs and that's all you have to worry about you know raise your family and sort of you know sort of living off the land and self-sufficiency and a lot of these aristocrats or people wealthier people in society kind of looked at this as the ideal way to be almost you know so they've done a lot of these paintings with these sort of lads sort of you know like lying down under a tree you know in this sort of beautiful landscape and it just you know, it just looks lazy. Well, it, like it looks like relaxing or whatever. Like it looks really like idyllic. Um, and we still have that today, I suppose. You know, we all like the countryside. We like the idea of escaping the city and going for a nice walk and sort of sitting having a picnic and that. I mean, that we still have that. But this kind of stuff kind of really came about like um, sort of, yeah, like the late 1700s, early 1800s. And this idyllic kind of rustic kind of pastoral scenes I mean, and these people were actually playing pipes as well. So I don't know. It was like, is it the chicken and the egg? Like, which came first? So you know, did these lads, these did did these kind of moneyed aristocrats begin to make pipes? You know, or or or, or support maybe pipe making because it reflected that it, like you know did they invent the pastoral pipes that's what i'm getting at like the, you know where where pastoral pipes an invention of the the sort of the moneyed sort of aristocrats that were interested in this music and this kind of folk kind of revival kind of thing of their own time or or was that was the pastoral pipe itself was it there all all along and these kind of more wealthier people help preserve it by romanticizing it now that i don't know the answer to that but like when you look at the sort of paintings from that time like these are the pipes that you come across so a set of pipes being played in ireland or scotland or england for that matter look pretty much the same in this kind of say mid 1700s so Often you will see paintings of characters, and someone will say, "Oh no, they're playing in, that. That's an early Ireland pipe there." And someone else will say, "No, that no, it's not. That's a border pipe." Um, and someone else will say, "No, it's not. It's a pastoral pipe." You know, so the so you, but they're the similar type of instruments that were played like on both of these islands, um, and they've like those instruments themselves are fascinating histories. And so where I am and. 
what I've been kind of experimenting with was like I'd like to have a set of pipes from those times from the 1700s what did they sound like what did they look like and to kind of get in touch with that as well that I kind of romanticize that kind of pastoral sort of rustic setting as well I do and you know I know all of the pipes came out of that tradition that that setting so Illin pipes came out of it Scottish border pipes Scottish small pipes came out of it and even like when I say about Scottish small pipes like some of the critics that are listening to this now might say ah like Scottish small pipes are only like a reinvention like like they're a re it, that, you know the redone to suit modern standards well that's that is true in a way but in another way it's they are a continuum because there were sets of pipes left like in museums like the Scottish small pipes are a very interesting um, history and pedigree um, because in the Scottish scene the, you know the, what, what was happening in the Scottish scene sort of in the 60s and the 70s like when you had the folk revival on um, 1960s, 1960s and 70s in Tottenham Bill, was that you know the the Grey Highland bagpipe music, like the classic kind of bagpipe styles, like whether it's like Peabrock or whether or whether it's like pipe band music, it had become so strict. Do you know, it had become so solid, and you know, you have to play the grace note this way, and you have to, you know, you have to play borals this way, and and you know, this tune has to go at this exact pace. And it all came it all became very like militaristic and and severe and and stern and like obviously because it it did come from that tradition like you know like like the British army preserved great Highland bagpipe in, in the regiments of the British army and by farming pipe bands they like I, I will talk about this again in more detail but like by farming up pipe bands and getting groups of pipers together and setting standards to the tunes that they were playing and to the instruments themselves maybe you'd have a pipe maker who would make like 20 sets of bagpipes so they all came from the same maker so they're all almost identical to each other and then you've got we'll say a repertoire of folk tunes and songs that were in the vocabulary um, that if you've got like a group of soldiers um yeah okay do i the military like has to set standards and everything becomes uniform literally uniform wearing uniforms and looking the same sounding the same walking the same dressing the same well the same thing happened with the music so you had got pipers who had repert repertoires of folk tunes and folk songs who were playing them in their own way and singing the songs in their own way and playing different sorts of sets of pipes like not unlike the the, the, the standard like Grey Highland bagpipe as we know it today but there were different versions of Grey Highland bagpipes they didn't all look exactly the same and they didn't all sound exactly the same some were bigger some were smaller you know at one time some only had one drone, then some had two drones, then the third drone got added, different things like that. Sometimes they'd sweeter chanters, softer chanters, sometimes they got higher chanters, sometimes the fingers were closer together, sometimes they were further apart. But So they were already playing their own sets of pipes and they knew their own sets of tunes, but when the standards of, the, of joining the regiment in the British Army and all the lads have to play the same tune on the same set of pipes, it just makes sense to standardise everything because you need an instrument that everyone can play. So, right, we'll say you have like one maker who makes 20 sets of pipes. Now, we've, now we've got 20 lads who are playing the exact identical instrument. So now all you have to do is standardise the tunes. So I was to say there would have been a common, a common wellspring source of tunes that were played, folk songs and whatever, and folk tunes, and they'd all know them. But again, like Irish music you would know your version of it and I'd play my version of it but all I had to stop and that ha they had to play it the, the same way so then it was written down and that was another big thing about like pipe music was 
like for centuries pipe music wasn't written down because most people were generally illiterate like in in their own language whether that be english or, or gaelic or scots they were illiterate so never mind being musically literate so like i'm musically illiterate now most people were completely illiterate or they limited li li literacy so music wasn't written down even in europe that goes back to what i was talking about the the, the transition from the kind of folky type medieval folky type of scene into the classic baroque scene and all that the, you know they started writing it down for orchestras and notations you know so you know groups of people in an orchestra could all play the same thing at the same time and now it's now, now it's your turn to come in and then we ease off and now we know we're supposed to come in a bit later and these are the exact notes we're supposed to play which stops it stifles the free flow of folk music and so the same thing had to, had to had to happen with scottish pipe band music was that the pipers there had to be a standard so whatever folk song you know name any tune like the bonnie braes of galloway i just made that up off the top of my head it could be a tune maybe it's not i don't know but like i mean that would have just started off as a song or a tune that someone sang and maybe someone added words to it or maybe someone didn't and but there's no good in uh, 10 of us all having variously different versions of it or played at different speeds or whatever like that. So then the standardization came in where they started to like, write the music down. And that was a big difference because prior to that, it was like, it was word of mouth and it was done by ear. And that, um, that's got, that, that, that style of Scottish passing on the, on the, 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 the tune still still sur survives in Cantoract. Like, there's a whole fascinating world there between Cantoract and Pibroch. Like, you know, Cant, 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 the word Cant in Gaelic means um, to speak. It does, actually does, just doesn't that mean that in Gaelic. It comes, it means it in English as well. Like, there's, like, there's an exp like, it, it, an expression like the traveling people in Ireland have their own way of speaking and it's it's it used to be called um travelers cant sometimes even sometimes today it's still called the cant or the gammon it's called as well and they have their own way of saying things sometimes they 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 jumble up words they jumble up the letters and words so as to say them kind of mixed up or back to front um sometimes they use irish words mixed in with this Sometimes they mix up the Irish word. Um, for example, I'll just give you one example. Like the Irish word for a boy is buchal, but in in the gammon or the cant, it's sublic. So you take the same letters and you just jumble them around. So buchal becomes sublic. Um, and sometimes in that language, that cant or the, the travellers cant and gammon as well, they use archaic forms of English words that are no longer used in English anymore. Um, so you have a mixture, you have a mixture of modern English words being mixed up. Um, you have a mixture of Irish words being used as purely Irish words and then Irish words getting mixed up. Then you have a, throw archaic English words into that and mix that up and then you mix it all together in a big pot and then it comes out as so the word can't means to speak so in Irish we'd say coint um, then as well in English that's where you get the word uh, to chant like chanting and in, in, in French it's like chant and chanter and that's where we get the word chanter from the, the very instrument we play on a chanter comes from chanter which means to chant or to sing or to speak so the traditional way of passing on tunes was by ear or word of mouth so like i can't do the counteract like put it go like say in in irish form if you're like you know we, we call it like diddly oi or diddly ah and we call it lilting 
and like so it's like Adam did it Leo did love did little low like you know did Leo did lead on did Leo did Lee and all that sort of stuff right but it's just a way to pass the thing on whereas in Scotland they were going he do hold on low like ho do he who he had on ho hold on all that sort of stuff so it was just the way to pass it on so then the person goes away like humming this thing in their head like and that's why to 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 less to less educated people it sounds like gibberish like you know it sounds like ah they're not even singing real words they're just d li diddle lo who heard him he heard o diddly i like <laughs> but the, it's not that we were singing gibberish it was that was the way to remember the turns and twists and phrases and pronunciation of the of the music like ho ro he ru he lo diddle um, you know that tells you how you should play that note you know what I mean so it started off as cantorock and then the cantorock goes on to pibrock because it's transferred onto a pipe and then that's played in an ornamental sort of style it's preserved and these, these things were preserved like this for centuries before they were written down but the key thing is now the key change is that when it was written down it kind of in one way it fossilised it, but in another way it fossilised one version of it. Um, because there was there was more fluidity in the thing. So if I was if I was to teach someone a tune, like if I was go if I was to tell you someone to, how to play a tune, like I would go I would go I go like do da da di da da do da dum do da di dum da da di da 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 dum da di do da. And that's a mixture of like Irish diddly oi and Scottish, like, counteract. But that's the way I'd how to, my way of explaining that that tune to somebody, so that they'd go away going do da dum di da dum do da di do da dum. Like, they're going to play that in their own way. And I've passed it on. But, you know, like the Chinese whispers, they're going to have their little version of it. And then in 10, 20 years' time, it might have even changed a bit. And then by the time they give it to someone else, it gets on. So there was a fluidity in these things. And when they were passing on these tunes and songs, it was fluid. And we didn't write down music, as I say, till the sort of late 1700s. Um, but when it did... It's kind of a double-edged sword because, in one way, it 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 preserved the, the 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 tunes of the time and the styles and the pace of the tunes at the time. It preserved them, and only for writing down. Obviously, you know, there's thousands of tunes that would have been lost to us. Um. But so, of course, I'm all for writing stuff down. Obviously, did not wait to record it. I'd much rather hear something recorded than written down. Um, and replayed by someone else but like obviously they didn't have recording equipment so all they could do was write it down but in another way in writing it down in my opinion in Scottish music it became too strict but then I suppose it had to be because you're in a military marching band that everyone has to be playing the same note at the same time at the same pace so we understand why they have to be regimented about it but getting back up to the folk scene of the 1960s and 1970s and that, there were lots of Scottish musicians, pipers, that had come from the bagpiping tradition. And they, even even the Cantorock and the Peabrock, especially Peabrock, became, when that was written down as well, you know, you know, it, it, it became very strict and very regimented and then with, with competitions and such like that if you didn't play it the way that they wanted to hear it you didn't get anywhere with it you know you were a failure or no that's no good or that's not the way to do it and then even certain standards crept in in Peabrook like you know that the like strict standards that if you didn't play it their exact way well then you're out of the competition and you know you're a nobody in that and and then so everyone when was striving to play it the exact same way as as which in one way they argue yeah that's good because it preserves the tradition 
But another way of arguing was it, of it was that well, it, you know, it's not because there's certain panels that judges favour. Like you could have like two or three different versions of a Peabrock, and then they only like you know one generation of people like like one version of that, and then the other two ge versions of it end up getting cast aside. And so you're only setting a standard for a very limited scope of things. And that's what lots of Scottish pipers were feeling in, in the in the sixties and the seventies that their craft of piping was becoming just way too rigid and way too strict. And they were looking at folk music from, you know, other sort of say, especially Ireland, where there's much more free flow in it and there's much more expression and there's much more individuality and Yes, even at a session, right? Okay, the musicians are all still playing the same tune, but different musicians would have different twists and turns in it and different styles. But it, it actually still sounds fine, all being played together. Um, or you hear that, say, say you hear, like, you know, you'd, you'd regional styles down a the tune. So, we're like in Donegal, like, you know, you'd Donegal fiddling was influenced by piping um, because a lot of the Donegal people. Um, preserved a style of pipe and first of all in illin pipes that was a bit different to the southern style plus they were over and back to Scotland an awful lot so they were influenced by Scottish music and this like Scottish pipe and styles went made their way onto the fiddle if you didn't have a set of pipes then you played it on the fiddle but you played the tune on the fiddle the way you heard the tune which was originally a bagpipe tune so Dun Donegal's fiddling especially is full of sounds an awful lot like a bagpipe in many ways whereas in other parts of Ireland you have a different style obviously and but but the good part about it is that these musicians actually can come together and complement each other they can still play a tune in this in a certain way and not get too mixed up or like that's the fun of it you know you, you know you you know then there's tunes then that everyone kind of knows that sort of is played a certain way but the difference with Irish music and Irish folk music and traditional music was that it was less rigid, you know. That word of mouth thing was still, like counteract, was still pretty much the way. Even though that the tunes were written down, there's a lot of license like given to uh, Irish mu musicians that, you know, if you've got a room full of like 10 people and we're all at lessons and we're all learning the same tune that's written down, well, that's fine. We all learn it that way. Um, but then once the class is over, you go off and you and you practice it and practice it. But then you'll develop your own way of playing it. And then each of those ten individuals have their own slightly different way of playing it. And as things go, that's their style. And nobody's going to stop them and say, no, that's wrong. Like, that's fine. But ultimately, when they all get back together again, they know kind of that there's the standard. The standard is once they all get back together and start playing it, the original standard kind of comes out again because... The little bit that you've changed, well, eight of the others hasn't changed that bit. And, you know, the bit that they've changed, you hadn't changed that bit, you know. So it all ends up kind of complementing each other in the end. And so getting back to Scottish small pipes, what was happening in Scotland in the 60s and 70s was they were seeing that Scottish folk musicians were going to other parts of the world. Like even they were going to like places like Brittany or, or Brittany, like listen to Breton music. And they were hearing Spanish pipers and other French pipers, Irish pipers. And even the north, like the north of England, like the Northumbrian pipers, were not as strict. Um, and so the Scottish were looking towards, like, kind of what you know, what instrument had we got that we could kind of is there a set of pipes that we could do this on? Like they were looking at Irish Island pipes, and they were looking at Northumbrian small pipes, and then they were looking at the round big bagpipes, and they were kind of going, you know, is there another instrument like that? You know. Must I take up Illin pipes or must I take up Northumbrian pipes that I can express myself and have my own kind of free flow moving off the great Highland bagpipes? Like, or did we have our own instrument? Like, and then so then the, then there was a resurgence in Scottish border pipes, which sounds an awful lot like a Scottish bagpipe. Um, it sounds the same kind of it's in the same kind of key, it sounds kind of the same kind of pitch. So there was a revival in that, but there was also significantly, and I think crucially, there was a revival of the Scottish small pipes as we have them today. It, it, you know, they looked, they found examples of small pipes, like literally small pipes, 
a lot of them are mouth blown, a lot of them are bellows blown, it doesn't really matter. Um, that had gone out of use and they were softer, they were sweeter. There were maybe one or two pipers still playing these old instruments. I don't know 100% for sure where there are existing sets of pipes still being played individually by you know, a very few remaining sets of pipers. I'd love to know that for sure. So if you know, let us know in the in the comments. Um, or did they specifically have to dig out old museum pieces and remake them and bring those old sets back to life again? Um, I believe there may have been a few hangers on. I I think the I think a lot of the the, the Scottish border pipe tradition kind of maintained that type of that type of tradition of Scott of, of of piping that wasn't connected with the the militarism of the great highland bagpipe that at least the tunes were preserved and i'm of the belief that some old sets of scottish small pipes were still being played i like to think that i hope that because i know like obviously scottish border pipes were still being played but th they were kind of few and far between but uh, as i say there was this huge surge of interest then in the 60s and 70s and then into the 1980s they were actually doing something about it where groups of Scottish pipers were getting together and they were saying look let's you know what let's look at what was what's left and let's let's remake these instruments you know so they took measurements of original old instruments and they also you see some of the older instruments the, the chanters like were tiny they were more like Northumbrian pipes and um, so the finger holes could have been spaced like really close together or they were kind of some of the chanters like the the whole spacing was sort of uh, like uneven kind of like you know there wasn't the same sort of space between the holes and again that comes from what i was talking about with that that rustic kind of piping that was outside of the classic sense where there wasn't a sort of a set standard way of making instruments and um, that you needed to play in an orchestra or with another gr larger group of people so in certain individual pipe makers were making chanters to suit themselves or to suit the piper who was looking for the chanter so if you thought it was a bit of a stretch for one of your fingers you could ask the pipe maker to just make that hole a bit closer to another hole or maybe it has to be a bit bigger or maybe it has to be a bit smaller to wherever it's going on the chanter so you did have all our chanters with kind of like ununiformed or non-uniformed fingering systems so there was a sort of a certain a sort of a standardization done with modern day Scottish small pipes in that the majority of these pipers were playing great Highland bagpipes and they wanted that fingering system to transfer easily onto a smaller, lower, quieter, sweeter pipe that you could play in the session. And so there was like a lot of chanters were kind of like remade to feel like a Highland pipe chanter or a border pipe chanter. Um so that you could not lose the whole repertoire of learning it. You, you wouldn't re, you wouldn't need, need to relearn an instrument. So I would say mod, modern Scottish small pipes are a sort of a hybrid instrument of, 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 of old existing sets of pipes that were still around, possibly still being played, definitely lying in museums and collections, with a new lease of life like bred into them um, from a Highland pipe tradition so at least you could get the finger if you're making a chanter at least a Highland piper could pick it up and play it you know um, and they also sort of set, set a, a certain standard on, on on the key of these instruments because the Scottish small pipes that were still there as I say they might have been still played in some places at home and they were definitely in museums but they were in different keys like they, they, you know, there wasn't a uniformity in the key of, of them, so they could be an A, they could be an F, they could be in G, they could be in D. You know, they could be, or they could be in some sort of a half somewhere. You know, a half somewhere between you know an A and a, or an A or and a B, or between somewhere set between a B and a C or whatever. So they weren't, you know, they were in different keys. So another sort of thing for the Scottish, the modern day Scottish small pipe was look, let's play them, let's make them again. You know, let's study the all sets, obviously study the all sets and take the best of everything and try and come up with, you know, a pipe that's 
universal that we can play in a session, you know, because you don't want an obscure kind of a key, like, you know, in modern sort of Irish music, like most things are in the key of D, for example. So most illum pipes are in the key of D nowadays. Whereas now you will get what they call flat sets. I don't know why they call them flat sets. I don't know about that name, flat sets. But anything outside, like on an illum pipe, like any, any anything outside the key of D is considered a flat set. But to my mind, they sound fucking beautiful. Like they sound much nicer than the D, concert pitch D. Um, even that, like concert pitch D, that means you could play it in a concert with other musicians. You know, classic, again, that's the classic modernization of an instrument. So an illum pipe and concert pitch D is the sort of standard now. But if ever you get a chance to, like look up um, Illin pipes in the key of C and in the key of B flat. And it's like listening to another instrument again. It's like rediscovering Illin pipes. But that's because in times gone past, not everything had to be concert pitch D. That only came about with orchestras and, you know, sort of setting standards. Whereas, like the Scottish small pipes, like the Irish Illin pipes were... Um, Individual, like, you know, different pipe pipers and pipe makers in different areas had different preferences. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, there were, the, the pipes were in different keys at one time. So a lot of the sets were flat sets um, and they, like, some pipes were in the key of D, but they weren't concert pitch D. And I believe, like, when they took Ellen Pipe into America, like, when they started playing on the stage and that, some of the pipes were too soft or they were too low and they needed that extra bit of volume, that extra pitch. So they started making like narrower bar, narrower or bigger bar. No, I think it's a bigger bar to get you a louder sound. So yeah, they, they were redoing the bars then. They were like remaking chanters or, or borrowing out chanters again to make them louder. Um, on Ellen pipes that did, so that they could be heard on being played on a stage in a room full of people with probably other instruments going. Whereas the original Irish pipes that had been brought over to America, and I think that tradition came from America. Now it could be wrong, it could have been happening in England as well and in Dublin possibly at the same time. Um, I've only heard about it happening in America more so that Irish pipers were bringing their, their emigrate, like emigrants and all that, like emigrating from Ireland and ended up in America. and actually finding that they could make a living at this um, but it turned into a concert sort of an instrument then as opposed to sort of a, a folky kind of a rustic sort of sitting around in a cabin or in a tavern or you know sort of an instrument um, now not to, look illum pipes I'm not saying they were only for the, the, the peasants or the paupers as well illum pipes had had money behind them as well um, with, with patronage but I'll talk about that in a while, in an, on, a, on another, in a little while, because that that ties in with preserving um, by an element of preserving Irish music through patronage that I want to talk about separately. But uh, yeah, so the revival of the Scottish small pipes was brilliant because it gave then pipers like a, a chance to play an older instrument, but in a modern setting like that's the kind of paradox that you know when you look at when if you listen to um like um julian goodacre like remember i mentioned those two pipe makers was julian goodacre and john swain they had this exact problem they were looking at old extinct set, extinct set of pipes that were played in england that had become extinct you know weren't being played anymore and last bits and pieces of pipes were ending up in museums and they meticulously studied these instruments, taking measurements and photographs and going back to the to the sheds and like touring the instruments again and trying to so but you're left with a paradox and it's it's when you're remaking a, a museum piece instrument or an older instrument, it's do I make it exactly sorry, you have the hiccups now. They'll go in a minute. Like, do I make this instrument exactly as I find it? you know, in whatever key it's in and make it now, but it's going to be unique. And <laughs> you'll probably have to sit there and learn a unique finger style of playing it. And you'll only ever be able to play it on your own because the 
the, the key that it's in or the pitch or whatever may not match other instruments. So do I make it as unique as it is in the glass cabinet? Or do I remake it near enough to what it is, but I could make it in 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 modern tones and pitches that's familiar to our ears. So I'll make it in D or C or A, you know? Um, that can be and I'll make and I'll drill out the holes of the chanter in 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 a fingering style that any piper can pick up and play. That's the paradox. Like you know, the modern is as such that it matches our tastes, our ears, and our fingering styles. Or else, if you make it in its original way, you need to get back to the original fingering style of you know of. So that's kind of the the, the paradox that they have um, with all their instruments. Um, and look, I can see both. I think if you're really, really enthusiastic in the history of the instrument and you want it as original as possible and sound in the original way, and you're prepared to learn a new style and kind of tune your ear into a new a new scale or whatever else, that's fine. Like go for it. Like believe in that. And I like to see odd, odd, oddities like p people who are dedicated to do stuff like that. But for me personally, I would rather not have to relearn everything and I would rather have an old style instrument but I would rather be able to play it in my in my modern sort of style so in I want to hear do re mi fa so and I want to, my fingers to be able to play comfortably that like one of them isn't stretching more so than the others or whatever or you know um so essentially that's what I had done um those two pipe makers Julian Goodacre and John Swain work together on a project for me um, so that my pipes that I play at the moment as I say I was looking at all these pastoral paintings of pastoral pipes like early versions of villain pipes early Scottish small pipes, Scottish border pipes pipes, various different pipes that are played across England France even other places like you know, Germany and that and that and but as more so started looking at the pipes from these two islands and the images of them and um the like archaic those old fashioned types of tunes um and songs that I'm interested in and you know, that kind of pre baroque sort of stuff and all this stuff was going on in my head. So anyway I wanted a, a pipe that like look like sort of some sort of an early version of an illin pipe or a pastoral pipe and played kind of like one but I because I was so used to playing Scottish small pipes and grey highland bagpipes I'd become so familiar with the fingering system there that I didn't want my fingering system to change and I like the A I like the, the a chanter in the key of A I think it's a nice key um I think it's just a, it's it, it's a nice compromise um, of a key. I think it's soft, and I like the mood that it sets. So in the end, the two lads got together, and Julian Goodacre made my um, chanter, and John Swain made my drones. And at the moment, I'm playing a set of border pipe drones, where I've got four drones: um, um, bass, baritone, tenor and alto sorry that's a raven gone past i love the sound of a raven um and then john swain made my chanter and um even the chanter was a sort of unique one because most um so it's it's a scottish small pipe chanter with border pipe drones and I play bellows blown and I have the drones arranged like illin pipe drones with an on and off switch that goes down so the, the, the drones rest down across my lap and I can tour them on and off and I play them with a bellows and it's an A small pipe chanter with A border pipe drones and they're made in the style of a set of pipes are several sets of pipes that I came across from the 1700s in museums. They're made of natural um, or native uh, plum wood because the older pipes were made of mostly of fruit trees. So you have apple and plum, uh, cherry, 
that was coming towards uh like how like they use box boxwood as well and you was used uh, like the oldest chanter in the world i think it's the ian dahl chanter that i think it dates from the 1600s that's made of you um so i wanted like native timbers now i don't know how native a plum tree is like maybe the, the romans romans could have brought the plum to britain um and then ireland but either way the plum the plum tree is here like for like centuries and centuries like it's not like like in part it's kind of african blackwood i must look that up actually how native is plum to these islands but anyway so the, but the, the old pipes are made of like fruit trees like so i i, I they're, they're made in plum and they're finished in cow horn um I, like i like the horn fittings like so it just looks like it looks like something out of the 1700s but um and it sounds like a, a barter pipe slash small pipe um so that was my kind of compromise instrument But uh, ultimately now what I'm waiting on um, is there's a there, there's a there's a fantastic um, duo of, of 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 pipe makers in America, um, Banton and Woodson, and um, they've sort of like they've kind of brought like you see you we right. We have such an array of pipes now, like since the folk revival, like the existing sets of pipes now that you have um, being played are Irish Island pipes, Scottish Highland bagpipes, Scottish small pipes, Scottish border pipes. Then there's another category that they're calling Cayley pipes or fireside pipes. And they've been on the go a long time as well. I'd like to know a bit more about them. Um, in so much as basically they look like a miniature or a smaller version of a great Highland bagpipe. So like they're mouth blown or sometimes they're bellows blown even. And you've got like three drones up on your shoulder, sort of separated, like three separate stocks up on your shoulder. And um yeah, I'd like to know how long they're there. Like, like, like are, are they are they a remnant again? Are they like a remnant of the past? That of these older sets of pipes that like weren't the standard kind of regimental thing that the Grey Highland bagpipe ended up being. Um, were they always there? Were they brought back? Or are they a complete sort of a, a reinvention? Um, are there lads sort of like pipe makers in America and Scotland and different places like kind of thinking you know play your bagpipes but just play a smaller set or a lower set that you can play them indoors I mean how new is that or is, I have a feeling it's not new I think that as I say I think there were so many different kinds of bagpipe played like before standardization that it's not such a new thing at all like I mean like you know why shouldn't there be um, different sets and different styles of pipe like bagpipes? There, there always has been. Um, but yeah, um, so it's fantastic nowadays. Like so, since the nineteen eighties, you've got like Scottish small pipes have like come on. So just in the last thirty years, they've really like they're not unusual anymore now. Like you'd see Scot, you see small pipes being played in sessions and that. And, uh, and it's only right that they are, look, it's not just so a new invention and it's, a, you know, it's a new instrument or something like that. Like it has, a, as I say, it has a great, I was talking about them before, they have a great pedigree. They were played at one time, you know, at one, you know, in a, you know, and, it, you know, they were revived, they were brought back to life. And I still think there was, I do think that, I like to think anyway, that there were a couple of sets kind of just clung on that might have been still being played a little bit or tinkered around with maybe and you know brought, brought out to be played or at least you know studied but that kind of pipe and tradition now is back and so now you have a lovely um great uh kind of diversity in 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 in, in music styles again in scotland it's not that look if you want to stick to the 
the rigidness of of the Grey Highland bagpipes were to play it in a band, a marching band, or to play Peabrock in a certain way. That's fine, like, you know, do that. But if you want the freedom to take a tune and kind of play it your own way, or play it with other, you know, musicians in an indoor setting and as a session kind of thing, like, by all means now, you can do that as well. So small pipes are being made in, like, you know, complimentary keys that you can sit and play with another musician if you wish and or let's just sit and play it on your own like it's up to yourself so it's fantastic that there's such a, a wide array of, of pipes now coming back like that are being played like more so than ever before in in scotland um, and even in ireland to a certain degree the scottish small pipes have caught on with bagpipers uh, like myself and um, a lot of us that are now there are just some bagpipers that are just interested in playing like marching in the bands and that's all they want to do but there's other pipers that like love to just play the tunes sitting at home like just for the sake of playing them um on on a more convenient and sort of sweeter sounding pipe so there's lots of us in ireland that are playing scottish small pipes and um, that came from a bagpiping tradition as well as when i say bagpiping i mean like great like when I say bagpiping, I'm always I always mean great Highland bagpipe. Otherwise, I'm gonna say Ilan piping. Like just to make that distinction. And hopefully, um, due to the efforts of uh, John Swain and Julian Goodacre, and I'm sure there are other pipe maker pipe makers in England as well. I just don't know their names because I've never dealt with them and and I've never spoken to them. So. It's 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 not that I've an agenda here, just trying to push two pipe makers. It's because I've I'm playing a set of pipes that both of these lads made. Um, yeah, that you know that I'm that I'm I'm saying their names, but I'm, I know that there are other pipe makers in England that are making um, like as like previously extinct sets of bagpipes to to revive bagpiping in England. Um, oh, just before I forget as well, um, my chanter, I remember I was saying that I'm playing um, a, a, a Julian Goodacre small pipe chanter in a John Swain set of border drones. Um, I love looking at Illin pipe chanters, um, the scalloping it's called. Do you know those kind of, those sort of soft um, carved out finger depressions? That you see going down the um in Ilan Pipe Chanter. Um yeah, how it's kind of indented sort of like they're kind of scooped out, like kind of hollow, sort of scooped out around the holes to help your fingers sit more comfortably um into the chanter. You see that on Ilan Pipes. Well I wanted that on my Scottish small pipe chanter and I couldn't come across any pipe makers that were doing it even. Um and even he hadn't it was he hadn't done it up 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 until that on a small pipe chanter. That's all got to do with the um what they call the chimney. It's to do with um the meat that's left on like the hole on the chanter and how much wood is left like say, you know, from the inner bar of the chanter, like the hole the note hole coming out of the inner bar how much meat that, that's on the wood how much of a gap or a distance is on the wood generally doesn't allow for it to be um sc scooped out or scalloped out um into depressions so what he had to do was he had to make the chanter like beefier and meatier and thicker so the chimney would be higher so that he was able to scoop down to bring it back anyway it's a long story but he did it for me one way or the other so my chanter looks like an uh, looks like an Ellen pipe chanter and feels like an Ellen pipe chanter, um, with the, like with the scalloping, and now other pipes don't have that. Like in, um, if you look at the Bulgarian uh, Kappa Goida uh, pipe, they have they have scalloped out holes as well. Um, I think, the, and the Swedish sack people has one has them as well. So it's not just unique to Ireland pipes, but um, I have not, haven't seen it on on Scottish uh, small pipe chanters. But 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 he did it for me. Like Julian was able to. He said it was a force for him, but and it took extra time and all of that. But he enjoyed it. He enjoyed the challenge of it, and it turned out perfect. And it, it lo looks lovely, sounds lovely. I must do a few videos of it, of playing them. Um, yeah, and. 
But I'm just hoping though that this catches on in England, like like that piping kind of English bagpipes come back, like the way sort of the Scottish small pipe. Like the Scottish small pipes a great example of how pipes can come back, and I do really hope that the English um, bagpipe makes a reappearance because it's. Um, if you look at the work it is too, lads, like and and I say the other lads as well, like just I just haven't looked up too much of other pipe makers because these two lads are just they're really like you know, they spent years of their lives studying this and and but there was some beautiful pipes played in England and um, that you know different parts of England like different counties of England and um, unfortunately they fell out of use down through the centuries and they only. They only clung on in the north of England in, in in the form of the Northumbrian pipes and the Northumbrian half longs as they call them, which I I can't tell the difference between Northumbrian ha half longs and the Scottish border pipe. And um, if you can, if you can explain it to me, could you write that down in the comments below? What's the difference between the Northumbrian half long and the, and a Scottish border pipe, or is it just two different names for the same instruments? Like because. You know, again, let's not get into the nationalism thing. Is it a Scottish thing? Is it an English thing? Is it does it belong to the borders? You know, which is an area all has its own unique culture and identity. The borders, um, you know, but I, I do, yeah, but you know, belongs to that area. Like it's not about country borders. It's you know, it's like folk musicians. Like music doesn't really have borders.